A very warm and pleasant morning, everyone. I welcome you all to the third day of Faculty Development Program 2022, organized by CMR University School of Legal Studies. Moving on to our first session of the day for session one, we have amongst us Professor Dr. Ashwini Kumar, Dean, School of Development Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. In a career spanning over two and a half decades, teaching political science, governance, development and public policy, Dr. Ashwini Kumar has privilege of engaging with students, academicians, diplomats, parliamentarians, development professionals, multilateral agencies and governments across countries like UK, Germany, Korea, China, South Africa and US. <laughs> so pardon me if I miss out something. <laughs> In recognition of his potential to excel further in academics, the Indian Council of Social Science Research has recently awarded him the prestigious Senior Fellowship. He is also a recipient of Azim Premji University Research Grant 2017. His book, Banaras and Other, has been long listed for Jayadev National Poetry Award 2017. He is also co-founder of Indian Novels Collective to popularize translation of classic novels from Indian languages. Sir is committed to institutional reforms in governance of fair programs. Professor Ashwini is proactively involved in monitoring and evaluation of Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act and National Rural Livelihood Mission in various states and districts of India. He is also member of Academic Council of Indian Institute of Forest Management. He has earlier taught at University of Delhi, University of Oklahoma, and also has been visiting fellow at Center for Study of Global Governance at London School of Economics, German Development Institute, Korea Development Institute, Northwest University, South Africa, and the list goes on. Sir has written research papers, articles for various national and international journals, led several extensive national and international research projects. In addition to his academic pursuits, Sir is also widely reputed Indian English poet and his anthologies are quite well received. He writes articles and reviews for various uh, uh, newspapers and uh, journals. We welcome you, Sir. We are honored to have you with us. Sir, over to you. <laughs> oh my God, it's really embarrassing. <laughs> my friend is here, your dean is here. Yeah, and uh, so. Indeed, very embarrassing, Prof. It's indeed very embarrassing. We were just talking about that, what stays in life and after life an academic. I think these glories won't last forever. But I think the prayer that we do every day to the Almighty to make us a good human being and keep us grounded, grounded here and take care of what we do joyfully is perhaps last forever. Yeah, so I'm very humbled and also honored by your generous introduction. The young man is very kind on me and very well trained, uh, but it's very embarrassing. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I'm here also and I was telling Prof that, uh, you know, what a messed up life I lead. Uh, so when I go to IITs and IIMs for mentoring talks, I always tell that I'm four dropouts. Uh, I drop out IIT, IIMs, uh, including uh, NST also. Most of the Bollywood, uh, uh, you know, the stars uh, happened to be with me, including uh, Nina Gupta was my senior, if you have seen Panchayat Serial. So four dropouts, not a good story. I can't tell my sons to drop out you know, if they listen to dad's story. That, uh, so, but anyway, I guess uh, but the joy that I'm here you know, is um, I survive every day, uh, all because of your love and affection for my works. And you keep motivating, particularly you know, Prof here has been very, very kind friend and always inviting me here to come and share my works with all of you. And uh, that keeps me going. After finishing my talk here, 
I will be heading towards, uh, you know, Bangalore Lit Festival. <laughs> That's the kind of a journey I enjoy. So today what I will present uh, briefly as part of the mandate of faculty development program. So take it as it is. And then perhaps if you have time to join, you know, I'm going to uh, read some of my recent works there also. And here what I'm going to do uh, 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 is uh, uh, something that I have been doing. So I give you a brief sense uh, uh, what I'm going to present here. And I guess I discussed with Prof uh, that this is a faculty development program mandated by UGC, if I'm not, isn't it? Yeah, UGC. So we are also running as part of that uh, mandate. And what I'm looking at, uh, you know, new pedagogical tools and devices, I think for the generation, next generation, uh, you know, that's very important to understand. And since, you know, a lot of things are going to change and transformed as part of the NAP, new education policy. So what I'm trying to do and sensitizing, you know, my young faculty here, we have been recruiting and we actually run throughout the year of uh, the faculty development program and mentoring program throughout the year. And so the new uh, faculty that we recruit uh, different kinds of faculty at different levels, uh, we train them, sensitize them to newer ideas as per the new education policy. So it's something very multidisciplinary. I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Somebody is going to, yeah. But I would like to go there because I can't see. I need to look at the screen. Or maybe if you can give me here something. Can you give me PPT here? Yes. That will be, yeah. Yeah, so, so let me just uh, continue with uh, new pedagogical devices and experiences that I'm going to do. Uh, what is this class? Where they come from? Can I get to? All of them are from here. All, 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 all. All CMR. All CMR. All CMR. Uh, They're from throughout India. Throughout India. CMR is very big, I'm told. But, uh, you know, I can see you have engineering college. While coming back from and the airport, I saw you. You know, huge. It's a very huge institution itself. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, new pedagogical devices and tools uh, and uh, perhaps you know if in this way i'm trying to bridge the boundary between social sciences and law you know we have worked together prof has and we were together at uh, different places as well uh, so traditionally if you look at the discipline you know the knowledge uh, generating discipline of law was you know kind of law early domain you know law early domain but now what has have happened, and especially if you look at NAP, the new policy, new education policy, the focus is more on multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. So you have to really grow with that idea. You can't just afford to be, uh, you know, in the, in, in, the, in the older format, older template of, you know, doctrinal kind of stuff, you know, where you are only speaking to lawyers. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to run through, and it's very popular, uh, let me tell you, um, I haven't done great work here because this is my popular lecture where I teach about uh, 200, 300 uh, students, you know, it's called, it's called, yes, yes, I can take, please. yeah, my pleasure, yeah. How much time Prof, you are giving me? No, no, <laughs> you have to also speak here, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I will give 40, 45 minutes and then I will interact with all of you. So this is the part that I do, uh, you know, and popular in the sense that this is part of my idea of India, you know, that I curate. Idea of India, if you're familiar, the term was coined by Nehru and then it was popularized in social sciences by my dear good friend and political scientist Sunil Kilnani in London. Uh, he published a book called Idea of India, 1997. Buy that book, you know, everyone. It's very cheap now. Penguin has published, uh, it's a long book, it's an old book now, but extremely important for anyone. I mean, like uh, anyone cutting across disciplines, you know. So there, uh, you know, I use a lot of, my videos are not here. I use a lot of videos, songs. Uh, I, I don't know if you're, a, if, if you're Chief Justice Raman I, and coming from that kind of a background, you will be shocked. But I tell you, let, let me tell you, I just made some presentation in, in, before the full bench of 
you know, election commission, it's quasi judicial institution and they have a bench system. So the two commissioners are like two judges and the chief is like the chief justice. And they loved my presentation mode, you know, my pedagogical, uh, you know, innovation. So I think things are changing. So with these uh, words, opening words, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about constitution of India and constitutional values. I think this is really one of the mandates of the UGC in terms of faculty development program. So that way, you know, we are on the same regulatory page. So we are there with you, filling one of their mandates here. So I was thinking of changing the title and I sent him a you know, message that, look, Prof, no, I want to continue with the UGC. At least, you know, my regulatory record is fine. The UGC is happy. So that, that's on that note, uh, you know, and how do you operate? Excuse me, come, come. This goes, yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Oh, it's the new, new laptop. Everyone loves uh, his or her own comfort zone. So I'm very comfortable with my laptop, <laughs> although it, my laptop has become a little odd. So let me see, you know, uh, uh, and this is uh, just a second. And, you know, th thrust of my presentation today that I will look, look at constitution, the founding moment, you know. In fact, I was sending a note, I was in the car and I was telling my, you know, I'm launching a new program. It's called MA in International Electoral Management, sponsored by, you know, Election Commission of India. And since there are very many women sitting here, so the note from Election Commission of India, they say that founding father, I don't like the term founding father, replaced it from my classes, my writings, you know. Finding architects, you know, where my mothers, you know. So I'm gonna talk about, you know, some of the hidden aspects of the constitution as a pedagogical tool, you know. So that's what I'm going to focus. I'm going to make this presentation as a pedagogical experience, you know. How constitution is a pedagogical experience, you know, than anything else, you know. And that's that's where I would quote also, both Baba Sahib, B and Rao, Aladi Krishna, they agreed together with, despite the differences in the constituent assembly, they agreed that ultimately this constitution that we are going to draft will become a pedagogical experience. That means that educative experience for us Indians who are not democratic by, by temperament, you know. Remember the term, you know, Ambedkar's um, mesmerizing statement that what is democracy here? is a you know top soil racing on a very very undemocratic uh, you know place so that's unlikely success of us you know unlikely unlikely success elsewhere this kind of experience would have failed but we succeeded how do we succeed let let me see some of the stuff i'm going to talk about why is study constitution of india and constitutional values you know i, I talk a little fast you know i hope we are on the same page and I have a huge mandate, uh, um, but I will just uh, skip, you know, some of the part when I just, you know, uh, um, you know, present my material here. So if you look at, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with Aristotle's comparative exercise of studying constitution. Times, like uh, he was the first master of comparative, uh, you know, comparative methodology. He looked at almost 164 constitutions in terms of city states and, and then created a typology, you know, different typology in terms of the regimes, you know, regimes like, you know, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, you know. And, you know, both, you know, master and disciple, Plato and Aristotle, were not comfortable with the idea of democracy. They called it the rule of mo mobs and masses. Uh, but now look at in our context, you know, you know, we have said we have, you know, given democracy a new spin. So in terms of, you know, Aristotelian idea, Indian constitution is not a prescriptive document. It is also a normative. Each word I carefully use. Normative, you know, it's a normative document, you know. Interpretive, you know, you can interpret. Every generation interprets it, you know, in his own and her way. Every generation interpretive document. And you can see the struggle is on, you know. Yesterday, you know, Chief Justice on the last day of his retirement, retirement, you know, took up the case of, you know, this money laundering case, you know, and said that I'm gonna, you know, look at two issues at least, you know, the whole idea of 
you know, presumption of innocence and also the issue of FIR submission. So it's a interpretive in a larger sense of interpretation, interpretation of the shared experiences and also pedagogically, you know, that's the focus of, uh, so that's something that we need to think about it in other places. Um, I've taught uh, constitutions elsewhere too, but if you look at American constitution on British, you know, British constitution, British, there's no constitution. And I'm sure that if you read Constituent Assembly, I think Baba Sahib Ambedkar was sensitive to that. In fact, he was not very, you know, uh, but he said that, you know, look, uh, uh, there has to be a document, but not necessarily. They have done quite well without document, uh, but they were prepared for democracy. We are not prepared for democracy. We say caste society, hierarchical society, so we have to have a document, you know, otherwise it will collapse, you know. So in that sense, if you look at uh, the whole document is not a prescriptive document. It's also normative, interpretive, and a pedagogical document. Shared also, I mean, I use uh, this feminist philosopher right from the beginning. You can see my tone is quite, uh, you know, uh, rooted into a feminist understanding of what I call shared political responsibility. Shared political responsibility. And that's one of the uh, core values that I look at, you know, that Constitution of India considers uh, someone a good citizen who remains responsive to the sufferings of core citizens and persons. I will come back to that towards the end. You know, that's very important to understand that, uh, you know, this is the, it is Marisa Young that, uh, you know, a constitution uh, is not a fragmented, fractured uh, experience, you know, it's, it's a shared polit you know, experience, political experience. Uh, and shared in the sense of what? Uh, you are responsive to the sufferings of others in the larger context, you know. Also, you know, in this sense, perhaps uh, I, I look at, uh, you know, both uh, combining fundamental rights and directive principles of a state uh, policy as having educative value, educative value, pedagogical value, you know. If you, do, if you don't combine it, uh, both fundamental rights and directive principles of a state policy, and just go through the, you know, debates, Baba Sahib Ambedkar's, you know, very, you know, powerful debate on why we have to have a non-justiciable section of rights. Otherwise, you would not respond to what Nehru says, wiping out tears from every eye. It won't happen. No constitution speaks that language, you know. No constitution. You look at Canadian, Australian, Irish constitution, no constitution can ever speak because they are grounded into the idea of law and higher law. So where is the possibility of, you know, taking care of poverty, ignorance, isn't it? Or caste atrocity, class, you know, inequity. That's, that's the language nobody speaks of. No founding architects would speak of. They try to look at constitution and design it more in terms of a legal document, you know, codification of rights and responsibilities, both from the citizen and also the state. So here, you know, that's what I call, you know, I guess everybody aware is aware of the constitutional morality, you know, constitutional morality. Any student, you know, any student of law, political science, and constitutional democracy is aware of why Baba Sahib Ambedkar, you know, deliberately quoted Grote, which he read in Colombia, if I'm not wrong. He was doing a class with John Dewey, philosopher. I remember if I'm not wrong, Perhaps his class was titled something like 21, History 21, I guess, you know. In the History 21, he read a lot about uh, Roman laws, including Groot. And here, you know, he's citing while defending the constitution that why we are designing this constitution and why this constitution is so bulky, huge, you know. I mean, since my school days, uh, you know, when I pick up the constitution, it's so very heavy, remember. So, so you can't carry the constitution in your pocket, you know, but those who are, you know, theologically oriented with the Bible keep the constitution too in the pocket. So here Baba Sahib Ambedkar looks at this idea, this idea of what I refer in terms of habits of heart, you know, in a Tocquevillian sense, the great, you know, philosopher of democracy, Tocqueville, you know, Alexis Tocqueville, who has written the book, Democracy in America. He says that unless you practice democracy in terms of the heart in a routine shared experience, it would not survive. It would not survive. Mere law is not enough, let me tell you. Mere law is not enough, you know. And if you just read assembly debate, you know, constituent assembly, it will come back and haunt you. That mere text is not enough. You can see without, you know, reflecting on what's happening in the country today. I don't want to talk about it like you. I'm also a government servant. 
bound by some rules of conduct, but you know exactly what's happening in the country. You know how the violations are happening, how things are happening, to what extent it's democratic, undemocratic. Raids are happening. One small Twitter, I will come back and say that you can get arrested. So that's something is not, uh, uh, you know, part of Baba Sahib Ambedkar would have called constitutional morality, you know. Uh, what he means by constitutional morality, I'm not going, going deep into the theory and jurisprudential idea of the morality, but I'm going to use what Baba Sahib Ambedkar actually meant, you know. What was his deliberate purpose, you know, why he was using it, you know. My sense is that I'm, I'm open to, you know, interpretation, but my sense, if I'm not wrong, Baba Sahib Ambedkar was using it also as a pedagogical educative value. He was actually educating us. He was educating his critiques in the assembly. He was educating his friends too, that why constituent, constitutional morality is so important. That means a paramount reverence for the constitution. Imagine in 46, 47, 48, 49, you know, given the climate of, you know, religious intolerance, genocide, you know, partisan genocide. We don't use the term partisan genocide, but almost like partisan genocide, you know, it was like a genocide elsewhere. I was in Germany last month and I went around seeing, I wanted to go to Auschwitz, but because of the heat wave, I could not go there. Next time I will be there. So that kind of a situation. And also given the hierarchical nature of the society, let me tell you frankly, 3,000 years, if you are hearing, you know, stories about that their constitution existed in Vashali, Ganapada, et cetera, et cetera, or somewhere in Telugu land or somewhere in Thailand, my friends and colleagues. That's not true. Baba Sahib Ambedkar would have rejected all these spurious ideas. Democracy and constitution coming together at a specific time for the first time. And that's because of your agency in terms of your struggle against colonialism and imperialism. It's nothing to do with those spurious ideas of antiquity, you know, nothing. In that sense, he is reviving and revisiting Rote. In that sense, he's defending a new idea of a republic based on law and justice. And that's the core value I'm talking, going to talk about here. And he says that as a natural condition of life society, imagine, you know, American jokes, jokes, I'm not going to share, but both life and love, you have to be a little bit unnatural, you know. But here, Baba Sahib, Baba Sahib Ambedkar is referring that to what extent, you know, the whole constitution is unnatural to us. Democracy is unnatural to us. It's a caste society, a caste society. I'm a J.S. Mill long back had resistance be independent. They're poor, illiterate. They're not urbanized enough, modern enough, you know. In this context, it's very important for us to remember what he meant by constitution morality as a paramount reverence for the constitution. Constitution, in the sense of you know, in the sense of what I have referred here, you can see non-discrimination. You know, non-discrimination, 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 foundation of our present-day constitutional morality. Non-discrimination. There is a very interesting, distinctive idea. It's called Republican idea of democracy, where we talk about non-discrimination and non-domination. You know, non-domination. They, you will not find non-discrimination and non, you know, non-domination spelled out in the Constitution. But you can just look at, you know, Article 17, which Constitution talks about, you know, abolition of societal evil, like untouchable. No Constitution. Give me an example. Any example around or about 160, 70 democratic institutions around the world. But here he decided that decisively put it there and where in the fundamental rights. That's the pedagogical innovation I'm going to talk about. And that is where, you know, Baba Sambedkas and others are actually expanding the very idea of constitutional morality by innovating, by innovating, right? So that's... Uh, so this is this is where a pedagogy of freedom and self, freedom and self, you know, freedom of the self, you know, and, and this is where I repeat him, he, I quote him. I love music, so please play it and we will enjoy it. So so let's just look at you. This is where, uh, you know, next. Done, ma'am? Yeah. 
Um, I think what I'm trying to do, I'm throwing a lot of, you know, political philosophers, Habermas, Grote, right? Uh, you just, you know, my lectures are always uh, a bit risky. I mean, like for younger people, <laughs> you know, because so much comes in and I always uh, tell them to read, read, nah, read. You, but because we are becoming Twitter generation, we hardly read any 50, 50, you know, like, word or 60 word. So what I'm going to do, here is the quote you can look at, you know, top dressing on Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. So that is why of late I have started teaching uh, constitution more as a pedagogy, you know, more a pedagogy, and also trying to sensitize the new generation that please, you know, don't go back to constitution more uh, in terms of, you know, some rights and responsibilities, you know, constitution rights and responsibilities, that's there. I mean, you have all the articles listed there. But once you are picked up from the house, arrested, they, they don't help you. You don't secure the bell, you know. Some of my friends, uh, and, you know, one of, is a very good Bollywood director, worked with me, and I was wanting to invite him to my literary club. He was just picked up, uh, you know, from his house. The reason, he just posted a picture on his Twitter. So all these rights and responsibilities are important, but the sense is something about what Baba Sahib Ambedkar means, you know, the whole idea of reverence for, you know, a different kind of experience of democracy means freedom and self-restraint, self-restraint, you know, in a hierarchical and caste-ridden society, which continues to do a lot of atrocities on each other. I began with this idea of being sensitive to suffering of co-citizens. That's what the constitution meant at the founding moment, you know. That's the pedagogy I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm making it clear. And this, this is where I use Habermas, the you know, great philosopher. He still teaches at Bodle. You know, I could meet him this time. I teach Habermas that, look, you know, who's known for his work, uh, you know, public sphere, Masoret public sphere, why public sphere is important for us in the sense of the constitutional democracy and constitutionalism. We are part of a common deliberative enterprise, you know, despite all differences. We are all talking to each other, communicating to each other, despite differences, you know. John Rawls called it overlapping consensus, the great philosopher. Overlapping consensus, you know. That is collapsing in the country today. That's collapsing in the country. We are just so intolerant of each other, you know. And that is why we are becoming, you know, you look at the language of the constitution, there is no scope for any majoritarian, you know, domination. But it's happening. It's happening. In front of you, it's happening. So that's where, you know, I guess I look at cultivating constitutional values and teaching in our, in our teaching and pedagogy, because it helps us create a culture of liberty, equality, justice, and fraternity. All these are very close to the heart of our Sabambedkar. All these, you know, he called it trinity, trinity, you know. What would you do without fraternity? Solidarity, and he used the Buddhist language of Maitri, Maitri, which is missing today. So that is why the constitution is a normative text, you know, interpretive text, you know, that's important to remember when we are teaching constitution. All I'm trying to do to speak to my colleagues here, that when we go to the classroom and teach and research on the constitution, perhaps this pedagogical, you know, dimension will be important. Now here, my, my, my quick, uh, and what I call now, I will take you through what I call visual anthropology visual anthropology. My songs and videos are not here because the dean told me that I have only 45 minutes or 50 minutes, but you know. Otherwise, in the large classroom, I have a large team. They take care of the sound. They take care of animations, you know. It's a very big uh, experience. You know, let me tell you, as a young professor, when I went to, I started teaching hardly. I mean, like maybe my age was just 22, 23. Those were the good days, you know, Achya din. Just pass out, do well. And um, I continue to remember those good days. And uh, I went to the, my class and I was very scared, so young. And they were all young, everyone. So they thought that one of their classmates had become a teacher here. So I went with a heavy, bulky Tom Botmore's book. I thought that will give me weight. When you are 23, I guess you need something. So groom, tadi, you know, there was nothing. You know, I was so young, hardly. So now what I do, cut back to my present mode of teaching, I use a lot of these stuff, in what I call visual anthropology, visual anthropology. And back all over the world, I guess, uh, you, uh, I was in uh, uh, 
Netherlands making a presentation. They loved the presentation and I figured out I hardly spoke anything. This was a discussion on my book. And imagine if somebody asks you to summarize your book, how difficult it is. You can't summarize your book in 30 minutes, something that you have written over 300, 400 pages. So I used some pictures, you know, here and there, and they loved it. So visual anthropology is also becoming a very good, you know, pedagogical tool. So here is, you can see Times of India, you can see the joy, you can look at, you know, uh, I, I always remember Nehru's, uh, you know, this incessant striving task of future. That is why you know, the constitution is, you know, all the time being expanded, amended, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see the the crowd's interested mood. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, this janda, you know, the har gar gar tiranga. I don't know to what extent it excited you. At least, you know, for a couple of days it did. Some, at least, if not all. Read my piece in Express, where I talked about it in detail, what I call civic nationalism rather than a different kind of a nationalism. But here, if you look at the dawn of freedom and also the dawn of constitutionalism happening together, twin, I mean, these are Siamese twins, you know. You can't cut democracy from constitution here. It's a rare experience, a strange experience. It never happens, you know. Or elsewhere in the world, you know, Canada, Australia, USA, et cetera, et cetera. UK has gone through 400, 500 of years of experience of your know, custom, usage, so on and so forth. But in India, it's just happening simultaneously, you know, Nehru and others. I use, you know, a little bit of sartorial language. I look at the eyes. I tell my students that look at intensity. Look at the intensity. When he's delivering his famous speech, tryst with destiny. This was destiny. And it influences in many ways the values of the constitution. So here is, and this is where, you know, despite differences, Baba Sam Ambedkar, Nehru, and others agreed. But the task of constitution is not mere, you know, spelling out rights and responsibility. The task of the constitution is here, the social justice, social welfare. This is the new language that Indian constitution is speaking, you know. And this is certainly, indeed, a great task, it's still unfinished. Despite the 75 years, despite, you know, still, uh, as per the data, 247 million people are below poverty line. Baba Samambedka, this is a lovely picture. I love this picture. I look at his eyes, you know, and also go through some of his notes, you know, in Bombay, at the library where he worked extensively. And the look at intensity, his immersive eyes, Immerses. Look at. I also look at his finger. You know, his everything. Just his muscle. You know, it's that kind of a, and and that determination in him. The determination in. Him. This is the beauty of visual anthropology. Visual. This, you can't get it uh, from the words only. Printed words. And these are. I mean, like that's gonna be passed. You know, the new. What is Vista is coming. Modi ji, Vista. You know, I think. God bless us. Gandhi, I mean, I'm not, I'm going to skip Gandhi much, but, you know, but just to give you that, uh, uh, there, there is not indeed one value system in the constitution, not just one value system, contrasting value systems, contrasting value system. And if you look at both Nehru and, uh, and Baba Sambhetka together rejected Gandhi, you know, they respected him, but rejected Gandhi because, see, they didn't agree with his idea of a village Swaraj. But Gandhi was a very determined, a jiddi kind of a person, you know, stubborn. So he, he saw that, you know, I'm going to be out of this whole process and experience. Then he asked his one of his disciples to write a constitution. Perhaps, you know, something that he would have written himself on Willis Swaraj and Willis Panchayat. You know that both Nehru and Baba Sam Ambedkar disagreed with the idea of Willis becoming the core because Baba Sam Ambedkar rightly, perhaps, and legitimately mentioned that what is village? Village is the den of vices untouchability, injustices, that can't become our future document, you know, that can't become our future value system. On the other hand, when you look at Panchal serial, you find that, look, there's so much in the village also. But in fact, you know, what Baba Sava Ambedkar was doing, I call his to and fro, back and forth journey. He was not dismissive of that idea. What he was dismissive of the practices, you know. Practices, you know. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, if he were around, he would have loved, you know, women serpents. 
taking you know agency in their hands doing so much work you know we have now millions of panchayats in india and if you look at you know the the reservation and the quota system for women you know elsewhere it hasn't happened you know the state hasn't happened parliament hasn't happened but if you look at you know the empowerment of the women through panchayat reservation it's mind boggling about which we haven't talked much about but let's see you know uh, so again you know uh, this is like a picture that you're familiar you can see women are here at least my god that's a founding father it's still election commission india I should write i can't write i want to you know, so for the sake of disclosure, I can't write and confidentiality, but you can write a letter to Chief Election Commissioner, kindly delete that, you know, founding fathers. They were mothers too. And a long pregnancy, you know, you remember the long pregnancy, like not nine, ten months, you know. I mean, like India is a mythic country where King Mandhata himself went through a pregnancy. Of late, I'm teaching a lot on LGBT rights, etc., etc. I'm very careful about their rights too now, sensitive to their rights too. So long pregnancy of the constitution. So some other time I will talk about, you know, in detail that grammar of pregnancy in the con in context, you know, because Baba Sambedka took about three plus years and it created some anxiety here and there to the extent that, uh, you know, the cartoonists started making all kinds of cartoons that is taking so much time, but a long pregnancy and look at the result, you know, it's still with us, you know, such a powerful constitution. I'm a saving us. You know. Saving us from what Baba Sahib Ambedkar famously said, from the grammar of anarchy, grammar of anarchy. He said passionately about, today I give you the constitution and save you from the grammar of anarchy. That's, that's the you know, uh, reason why we need to think about uh, you know, these uh, pedagogical experiences. Again, you know, you can talk about, I guess uh, I would have loved to see constitution. I've taken this from the original constitution, only bilingual, bilingual. I would love to have, you know, Tamil Telugu also, but I don't know how it skipped, you know. These are some of the omissions of the language of the constitution, you know. And that is why you can see still the language is a, you know, is, is a controversial issue. Uh, maybe in my uh, other class where I talk more about uh, stalemated aspects of the constitution, the language part, you know, the language part. Uh, and they stalemated it. But in the stalemate, they agreed to have a consensus. Drop this matter. Let's continue with English for a while, 10 years, and let them use their own languages rather than having a national language mandated in the constitution. So there are a stalemate, you know. This stalemate, jurisprudential stalemate, uh, you know, are a result of a consensus amongst them. The guy, I love him, I discovered recently, uh, Prem Sangha Rai Zada, who actually penned it, uh, penned it you know, with the pen and nib. I don't know, I'm not using, because of now laptop generation, I'm also, so let's remember. And the original constitution was not typed, but handwritten both in English. Uh, Rai Zada was a student of Stephen's a family of calligraphists. Some of these things are hidden from us. When you look at constitution, merely legal document, it doesn't give you joy. It doesn't give you those hidden normative issues of art, aesthetics, and culture. So you can now imagine that constitution is beyond imagination, something very different, you know. The ink pen, I will drop, you know, in fact, I have looked at the, you know, 432 pen holders names were used. Can you imagine? 432. Six months to complete the task. Here. I love it. It's a delight of an artist. A delight of an artist. That's the pedagogy I'm looking for. The constitution is also, uh, uh, is, is an artwork. Aesthetic experience, you know. So when you're a lawyer, go to practice, tell judges, tell judges that this also protecting constitution and promoting constitution is an artistic and aesthetic experience. Nandal Bose, you remember, you know, uh, that design and did, it was there designing the part of the constitution. Here, let me say, I mean, like maybe uh, when you go to Delhi, it's in the archive constituent, you know, in the constitution library this is still there and Bawasa Medkar predicted that the constitution that the original uh, is still original uh, will last at least a thousand years so guys I'm really confident about one thing wherever I'm I would be 
uh, as a dead dead never speak you know because adam the, the king said famously you know dead never come back so what do you do do today you are not going to come back but if i ever come back i'm sure that i will find this constitution so that's so, you know, so what it means what it means why I emphasize it i emphasize it about durability longevity you know the longevity of these values and because of these values the constitution will last forever despite the challenges despite the challenges and let me tell you, tell you other day um, my good friend celebrated political scientist uh, washner we were together at harvard so he just published a piece and sent to me and i said that oh no i don't agree with you ashwini because you are very evangelical and very kind of optimist i said that yeah indeed i, I believe that we will last at least 1000 years but he is give me example comparative in chile brazil elsewhere constitution can collapse and disappear let me tell you it can collapse it can go it can it can go any time any time let's think about it i am not going to resolve this issue but uh, elsewhere it has happened but i i am an evangelical you know i mean like so i believe that it won't happen it won't happen we will go to the you know library take it out you know the parchment uh, on the paper where it is the paper is going to last at least 1000 years just you go there and feel it it's a very sensuous feeling very earthy feeling touching the paper you would not be allowed to touch it but you can see it you can smell it i'm sure that i mean like so that's where i beg to differ with my colleagues uh, you know i'm i'm leaving all these parts you know come so just the fathers part you know i mean like you know these fathers na everyone from the school days so these fathers are known to us my student love this <laughs> and now here and they do all all they they are great people i'm not dismissing them i'm not dismissing them i i'm 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 saying that they are good you know they have done what here the women the founders the founders you know i guess so one of the things missing in the classroom teaching perhaps from us and we are all complicit you know let me tell you in jnu university as where everywhere in the world where I, i went i never found women being discussed as the makers of indian constitution they have been discovered there are 15 you can see them and how and as you know there is in, in fact you know believe me there was a dalit woman right at the foundation moment right minority we speak of the minority right so you know one of the very important uh, you know founding uh, stones of uh, you know liberal democracy so you can see that um, uh, you can see ammu and ras you know you can you can dakshin in that you know from cochin you can see her uh, and the video i'm not playing so i'm not dying hansa mehta such a frail i love this picture of hansa mehta she was so frail uh, you know like another gujarati like gujarati one is the prime minister here who is known for like this you know 36 76 whatever chest you know and look at this woman you know i mean like you know small frail woman but if you look at her video here it determined voice strong voice so these are the women that we need to think about in terms of the gender contribution something i would you know skip here and now coming back you know of late my friend just buy this book again you know my friend philosopher akash uh, singh rathore has written wonderful you know book very provocative book is called ambedkar's uh, wait a second where it, i have brought it here the ambedkar's preamble just buy it read it teach it in the class a secret history of the constitution of india akash singh rathore is a very very maverick philosopher you know from wine to ambedkar he can teach you. so so here you know so in a way sometimes just i spent hours only on talking about preamble and constitutional values preamble and constitutional values is very important for us to look at you know so justice liberty equality and fraternity you know and how bahas have ambedkar you know coded into into the preamble the whole uh, you know system of constitutional values what he meant by constitutional morality back here on the pedagogy in a more theoretical uh, sense a pedagogy of empowerment non discrimination and non domination 
So I have already been said about Nehru, Tagore, etc., etc., and Ambedkar. I combine them. I combine them. Of late, I'm also expanding this trinity, including others from different regions, including Nagaland, Manipur, you know, the tribals, you know, Jaipal Singh Munda, back here, you know. And imagine when, them, when people were talking about Murmu becoming president, or all kinds of things were being talked about, about a woman, you know, all things, you know, partisan, you know, narrow-mindedly. But remember, for 25 years back, you know, one guy from Ranchi, Jharkhand, another Santal stood up, who was known for his excellent work in Cambridge. He was our, perhaps, hockey team captain or football team captain, you know, participant in Olympic. He got up and before Ambedkar said that, look, you might call me jungly, you call me I'm a forest man, but this constitution cannot happen unless until you have a woman here. And believe me, just go and check out and come back and correct me if I'm wrong. In the drafting committee of Baba Samhamedkar, not a single woman. Baba Samhamedkar admitted later when Jaipal got up. He said, yes, it's true. But we need to compensate for that. We need to compensate. 75 is down the line. Finally, even in a symbolic sense, it has happened. Even in a symbolic sense happened, but that's the language I want to speak in terms of pedagogy of empowerment. You know, liberty, liberty, I'm going to talk about two kinds of liberty here. Largely using philosopher Isaac Berlin's ideas of two distinct liberty, negative and positive liberties. And I'm sure that as a student of law and political theory, uh, jurisprudence, you read about uh, you know, these liberties, you know, negative and positive liberty. Most constitution around the world speak the language of negative liberty. Do this. If you do that, you have, uh, you know, Miranda rights in America. And here you have, you know, rights against preventive detention. Also, even if you preventive, you are arrested, you have, you can hire a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. So mostly if you look at from article 14 until 31, 32 is different, you know, that's about remedies. But if you look at the language of the constitution of this part, it speaks mostly of the negative liberty, you know. If you do that, we will give you this and right. And don't do it. Or if you do it, but there is also where, uh, you know, I began with, uh, you know, the combi combining fundamental rights and direct principles of state policy. And this is where you look at and why they deliberately made Krishna B.N. Rao chose to put it in that framework, you know, non justiciable, you know. Because fundamental rights, believe me, is, is something that is left to judges also. And Baba Sahib Ambedkar was never, was never comfortable with the idea of non-elective judges becoming so powerful. In fact, in a famous statement, he said, how can only six to eight men take the responsibility of deciding about everything? But then he agreed that we need to have, you know, some idea of judicial review, some idea of judicial review. But he was very, very circumspect, you know. He was cautious about... Uh, so here you look at liberty, he looks at liberty more in the sense of positive, you know, that Nehru is speaking about, uh, you know, trust with destiny. Baba Sahib Ambedkar is talking about social democracy, you know, abolition, annihilation of the caste, you know. These are the mandates in the constitution, perhaps hidden in the language. And this is where I use, you know, positive liberty, positive liberty in the sense of, you know, self-realization, large welfare goals, et cetera, et cetera, isn't it? So you look at, you know, the active principles of the state policy. So whole pedagogy that I'm looking at. Uh, uh, fraternity and Baba Sama Ambedkar, it's a very, very important uh, pedagogical experience, you know, fraternity. Until now, until now, we are struggling uh, to teach it, each other as a co-citizen, co-citizen, you and me. And in the sense of what philosopher Habermas calls intersubjectivity, 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 not just interlinked, you know. So in the preamble, you know, when he chose to use the term fraternity, what did he mean? He meant as Upendra Bhakti, you know, justice Upendra and jurist, he calls it fellow feelings, you know, fellow feelings, you know. Most, most constitutions are designed in a way, remind me when I have to stop, uh, you know, designed in a way, uh, you know, like ruler and ruled, you know. And that's where, you know, distribution of powers mentioned in the constitution. But Bhava Ambedkar took it to a different level, you know, took it to a different level of looking at, uh, looking at this whole idea of fellow feeling, maitri, you know, maitri. That was this idea. And this maitri today, if you look at 
how Indian constitution is being used in the climate debate, you know, and the global climate warming debate, you know. This also speaks the language of flora, fauna, earth. That's the inventive part of the constitution. It's a magical experience, I tell you. And that is why this constitution becomes so interpretive, you know, opens up possibilities, you know, unseen, unknown possibilities of its use. Maybe abuse too, misuse too. You can use it, misuse it. I mean, like, I fought cases in the Supreme Court as a PIL activist in my other time, in my younger days, but not anymore. <sighs> I will skip this, you know. And these are more. Here, coming back, you know, this is, this is where uh, I'm concerned of late, you know. And you can see that, you know, the value, uh, you know, constitutional value, sedition, freedom, and expression. I use a lot of cartoon, look at the stuff. And, and Asim, uh, you know, Asim was arrested, uh, you know, just for a cartoon. Where is the cartoon? That I deleted that cartoon, and that was little, you know, looking at Indian Parliament, uh, painted a commode and compared a commode to Parliament, you know, and he was arrested. So mere cartoon, mere cartoon. Bol Kilab, uh, this was a famous sedition, banning, gagging. You can see, you can see, and this is where I'm sure that you know thinkers and uh, jurists uh, are concerned. Your battery is running low, ma'am. Here. No, I thought it's my laptop. Please. Can I come there? Can I sit there? Huh? No, no, why not? I'm not going to grab your chair. Can I sit there and talk from there? And you can run. Achai, Stian. Huh, it's done. Yeah. So it's like my laptop. Yeah, it's coming, 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 coming. It's still running low, ma'am. Just turn on, turn on, turn on, turn on. Yeah, see, see, huh? Ah, better. Better, better. Ha, huh, I'm now chatting. Yeah. Okay, so now back here, back here, you know, um, uh, and, and perhaps the concluding part, I'm going to now, uh, now do it. Sorry, ready? Ready to go? Yeah, don't worry. So uh, the, now you look at, you know, now we look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, despite having, you know, different rights of freedom of expression, etc. you know, lawful assembly, so on and so forth, but still your rights have been curtailed, you know. Just look at PMLA. They come, knock the door, you are arrested. No FIR being sent. Nothing. Now the Chief Justice has said that I'm going to review it, at least on two points. And this is when you look at the whole body of the director principles of the state policy. These are really very important set of rights. I call them rights, you know. And 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 you remember Bawa Sambedkar said when people ask them that who would bother about it? Why are you putting it out? Such a lengthy, you know, section. Who would care about it? He said that at least the rulers will care about it. If you don't care about it, the next he said that when they go to elections, they will have to speak to people and citizens. They can't avoid it. But there was a larger thing which he did not dwell much upon it, which I'm going to explain, you know, the pedagogical promise, the DS, DPSP's pedagogical promise, where Baba Samambedka did not, uh, you know, speak much about it, just left it open, uh, you know. Uh, like an open-ended interpretive sense uh, that it would expose both the rulers and the rule, rule, rulers and the rules to the proper exercise of the power. You're arrested, you're, you know, like NRC, all things are happening around the country, many things are happening. And this is where I guess uh, this pedagogical promise, this educative experience must be, must be learned by lawyers, activists, judges, and practitioners of the law. That this is a promise, a pedagogical promise that has not been realized, but must be realized you know, sooner or later. And then you look at, you know, duties, you know, remember the sourcing committee and emergency. And uh, I'm not someone very comfortable with that section, you know, myself, myself, very not. And because this is something alien to me, but now it's there. 
part of it and the judges have called it right you know you have to have but now now i look at you know the set of duties more in the open ended sense you know a respecting historical monument why won't i respect i would certainly but every if you start looking for civiling in every monument now i am not going to consider it constitutional duty let me make it very clear i will use the constitution against you that's not the language of the duty that's not the pedagogical language that you are using you everywhere you are looking for civiling in my house your house every house and a bulldozer then that's not the constitution let me tell you frankly i'm not fearful anymore that's not the language of the constitution that's not the language of reverence for that it's not meant by respecting historical monument isn't it you are actually corrupting it the set of duties but if you respect nature fauna and what i want i would set him so in fact you know there is a gandhian tone here gandhi and ambedkar disagree uh, you know on this idea of rights versus duties gone more into you know, like a, uh, just a second is on his own ideas gandhi did fantastic work indeed but gandhi was more like duty kind of you know his language gandhi if you read hind swaraj i have worked on hind swaraj written hind swaraj also uh, gandhi was in a way very radical thinker no doubt about it no doubt about it uh, certainly he was not comfortable with the whole idea of liberal constitutional democracy that's a separate issue but gandhi focused more on duties and baba saheb ambedkar on rights you can see whole sapa but they came together also when you look at baba saheb ambedkar one of the reasons intrigues me maybe uh, i need little more uh, uh, investigation into of late i'm reading why baba saheb ambedkar supported limitations to the rights you know we have six seven limitations public order morality you know i speak here there are sev several fir's filed from mathura kashi every every place you know why these limitations you know by this limitation so on the one hand he is giving us a set of you know powerful rights uh, and the same time baba saheb ambedkar limiting it limiting it you know? limiting it. why i mean like, this is a puzzle i think legal activist and jurist uh, need to probe you know what was going on in its mind somewhere in the constituent assembly he gives a sense that why i wanted to do it uh, he relied more on his class uh, with john dewey and american constitutional experience uh, and he wanted to make it a uh, very clear that i'm not going to leave it open ended like american constitution american constitution like this tiny i used to teach almost in a class there was nothing you know amara constitution is like you know whole truck you have to take there and explain i work with election commission and there is a section on election commission you know every every the administration part is also well detailed so like the 6 7 limitations uh, to the constitutional rights uh, baba saheb ambedkar spoke up that we don't want our judges unelected body indians are not prepared indians are not trained indians have no experiences of constitutional democracy and constitutional values they need to be told about everything that you have right to life liberty you know you also have to respect that you are not going to come and crush me with a bulldozer so you see imagine imagine a situation of bulldozer He imagine the situation of majoritarian democracy, electoral majoritarianism. That could happen. He imagine. That is why he created a set of like Americans, you know, uh, you know, limitations. But it's still a puzzle. I mean, like it's still a puzzle. You can see that how these limitations have become tools of operation. Tools of operation. <coughs> some some uh, you know uh, ideas I want to talk about. Uh, which are actually not part of uh, you know any constitutional discussion uh, here but you can see that how our constitution also speaks you know we come from uh, you know our independence is not a gift neither of the divinity nor of british imperialism we achieved it through our own agency and largely through you know extra constitutional quit india movements satyagraha civil disobedience tribal movements dalit movements all over you know we don't talk about it in the constitutional text you know but somehow constitution refers to these uh, you know embedded ideas of you know padyatra rahul ji also going on padyatra what kind of padyatra he would do i'm not sure modi ji has never taken a padyatra he do he does digital padyatra 
some bhavas do your talayatra. I don't know what it is. But in a sense, you know, on a lighter note, the padayatra, padayatra is, is, is referred to in the language, you know, theoretical language is a mass mobilization, activating civil society. And you can see how I refer to removing untouchability, which is a fundamental right, you know. Unfortunately, upper caste feel that it is not their responsibility. Unfortunately, you know, because this is a right available to everyone. This is a right available to everyone. It's our, what Baba Sahib would have said, joint responsibility, collective responsibility of late democracy has done it, done it. So Padayatra, community, ethical citizenship. I don't know if you have read Japrakash Narayan's Total Revolution, a critique of parliament. All I'm using, Upendra Bhakti used to be our teacher and very uh, powerful jurist himself, writer, that all these critiques of the democracy are also part it, you can still do things in you know. Coming back here, you know, my, you know, I'm using a very brilliant uh, Italian, uh, Robert Unger, uh, studied him very carefully. He's very popular, uh, you know, in the law circuit. Uh, uh, if you read him carefully, uh, critical law, and, uh, you know, he does a lot of uh, that kind of stuff. And in fact, you know, uh, although we have a, Constitution. We have a constitution, but it's still a work in progress. Work in progress. But here and there, you know, my sense is I would a little bit disagreeing with Robert Unger that you know everywhere you put out, out, you know, in Bangalore, whenever I come, it's very chaotic, noisy. Thirty years back, when I had come to Bangalore, it was such a peaceful city, you know. Now it has become so chaotic. Everywhere I find work in progress. So if you put a work in progress, uh, you know, huh, work in progress, uh, and that becomes, uh, you know, challenging. You know, real estate uh, developers and the, you know, crony capitalists have taken. I have a certain fears these days about our constitution being subverted, taken over. Let me tell you, I mean, like, it's not very, uh, you know, although we are not on a fragile constitutional bedrock, but uh, I have certain, you know, uncertainty, you know, looking at uh, how, how the language of the constitution can be subverted, how the practice of the constitution can be subverted in the name of work in progress. The builders will come buy your house and convert into a mall. That could happen here too. Let me tell you, I, I think to that extent, I agree with Asutosh Vashne, Pratap, Mehta, et cetera, et cetera. But in the sense, I'm gonna go back to our first Dalit president, K.R. Narayan, and himself was a great student of Lasky, Harold Lasky. And if you remember his foreign service entry is this one page recommendation of a professor. He wrote a letter to Nehru Lasky, Professor Lasky, philosopher, that I'm sending you a brilliant boy. And uh, so he said that it's not whether it's the constitution that has failed us or which is we, we have failed the constitution. I think I'm, I'm not able to figure out what he meant by it because looking at uh, you know shared experiences and practices of the constitution, I guess, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, we lack this engagement with the pedagogy of the constitution, pedagogy of the constitution. And here, this is where I would like to, you know, give uh, a couple of, you know, concluding remarks uh, that how I look at uh, democracy and I try to interpret it more in terms of Martha Nussbaum, another very feminist uh, thinker and philosopher, that our democracy is basically democracy of capabilities, you know. And it is where we use Aristotelian idea of flourishing, a daimonia, an aspiration of human life and happiness is wide in possible meaning. If I were a judge, a chief justice, in every judgment, I would just put it there and examine it. Am I, am I doing justice to this? Am I thinking about, you know, aspiration of human life and happiness in the widest possible, you know, meaning? I went to Bihar with my students, uh, worked with the chief justice, and we got released 400 under trial prisoners. Languishing in the prison, not even one trial. Not even one trial. There are thousands of people, uh, you know, languishing today in the prison. You know. What I'm doing? I think this is where I fear the most, you know. This is where I worry about uh, whether or not uh, the constitution will become a democracy of capabilities, you know. And this is uh, how Baba Ambedkar drafted the constitution in this magical handiwork of democracy of capabilities, you know. Idea of India. So this is where I return and say that uh, ultimately quoting 
Indian constitutional rule of right has become stronger. Perhaps when I wrote this, I was in a better mood and better temperamentally sense. I was more evangelical, but of late I'm concerned about it. Last year I wrote this piece and I was talking about, you know, how you know, it's still strong and how Baba Sahib Ambedkar predicted that one day India will become United States of India. And this is where I put a lot of faith, you know, that the constitution will be certainly, you know, remain as it is, uh, you know, uh, through the democratic revolution from the ground up. You know. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, okay. Ekta, man. Ekta, I don't have a video. Thank you very much. Sincerely, I got it. Thank you, ma'am. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much, sir, for precisely explaining the values of constitution and democracy now and then. It was indeed an informative session for all of us. Any questions, participants, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Yes, ma'am. Name, 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 point of view, sir. Sir, I want to see party activity and murder across India. And they are involved in the uh, major, uh, you know, information from the government. I think it's the murder of democracy. And uh, personally, I see it's a threat to the India. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. Because the present RTI has been fine. I don't know what to do with it. Huh. I depend on the doubt. For us, I don't know what to do with it. Rashikar, you are a very kind and generous person. I met yesterday, and uh, he's a wonderfully gifted. Uh, Faculty is very articulate and uh, he's on the path. He told me that. I tell the Rasik, tell me what is your, I mean, like when I recruit faculty, please sit down. Uh, so I recruit, ask them first question What is your strength? You know, what is your virtue? Uh, shock me. I mean, like, I don't want to hear that I'm very intelligent and I've done good. He said that, sir, I'm a risk taker. I'm a risk taker. Welcome to the world of RTI. And I wish you all all good things. <laughs> I'm sure that you won't be murdered. <laughs> but if you are a risk taker, you know, let me tell you, I, I have been part of this whole journey. I was fresh from the US and uh, uh, my director told me go and uh, attend a meeting in JNU. I didn't know when I just walked into a room, my older you know, university. Uh, so just walked into them. There were some, some 10, 15 people. I said that this is the meeting that's going to happen. They were drafting RTI. Only 10, 15 people. But they were risk takers. answer uh, to you but the fact is that uh, like any any uh, any regime any regime any regime would not like it would not like it i mean like any government in power would not like it you would not like it when you become a vice chancellor let me tell you honestly today you are a staker the moment you become a vice chancellor or is officer you would not like rtm so come back here what i said you know at the beginning if you take it as an educative experience, pedagogical experience, perhaps as a value, we start liking. That is why Ambedkar was very clear, director, that we are not prepared for that. 
We are not prepared for this. Unless we take it, soak into this kind of normative experience, you know, that transparency is good. As a value, that is where, you know, the major challenge we face. Mother will say, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen, that's common, many parts, you know. Every government in power tries to restrict RTI. Every government has done. Manmohan Singh was very uncomfortable. Modi is very uncomfortable. You and me will be very uncomfortable as a prime minister. You would not like to give details of how many cups of coffee you have, how many times you have visited, you know, foreign countries. You would not like to give details. Um, you know, we, we are part and parcel of this transparency movement. So we know exactly that it can work both ways. It can hit me hard. It may, so that's why we put in privacy clause there. There is also a privacy space, but that's... So let's see, I mean, like, I, I don't know exactly what could be the answer, but my sense is, as a pedagogical promise, RTI needs to be realized. Any other query, ma'am, see? What do you teach? What's the name? Uh, international. But do you think that the uniform, uniform civil code is necessary? <laughs> I, I launch a counter question. Indeed, it's part of the directive principles of a state policy. But if you look at the debates, you know, in the constituent assembly, it is again as part of my understanding of what I call intersubjective stalemating. We deliberately, deliberately kept this question unanswered. Uniform civil code. So a stalemate was necessary and continues to be necessary. And if you look at you know the broad uh, set of uh, theoretical philosophical arguments about. Uh, why we should not have uniform civil code. I think we should read uh, uh, Sandel, Professor Sandel teaches at Harvard, uh, my teacher too. And, uh, uh, and then Walzer, Michael Walzer, Sandel, and you know, Charles Taylor. I mean, like, these are together three of them called the pioneers of communitarian rights. And this is where, you know, I guess, uh, 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 you know, another day, and maybe we can talk about separately. Uh, Indian constitution is a very rare, hybrid experience in the sense, uh, if hybrid can be a good word, it tries to go beyond liberal, uh, you know, constitutionalism, liberal constitutionalism. From the days of, see, Hobbes, Hobbes uh, Locke, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, Rousseau, etc., etc., the days, if you look at, you know, Bosanke, T.H. Green, so on and so forth, in the liberal, uh, you know, pedagogical sense, you know, um, these thinkers and philosophers looking at the constitution, the constitution is largely a set of liberal rights. You know. There is no scope for communitarian rights, but Indian constitution is unique. You know. So right in 47, 48, 49, the founding uh, architects uh, also put in clauses about uh, communitarian rights. Article 28, 29, you can see that language rights, linguistic rights, cultural rights, amazing. You know, like when people started talking about in Europe, in fact, uh, Kamilika, you know, was the senior to me in, our, in Oxford, Kamilika's book, uh, Multiculturalism. Now, multiculturalism has become, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the era of Islamophobia, xenophobia, uh, a threatening word, you know, I mean, like a threatening. India is a diverse land. There are multiple communities, many communities. Diversity is so much here that Baba Samedkar ultimately said, that let's have 50, 50 states, more than 50, maybe 100. Maybe 200, imagine, it's almost like a continent, you know, continent, it is a continent. Coming back here, summarizing, you know, and uh, my sense is that, you know, it's, it's a very, very, uh, you know, tensile and delicate relationship between liberal rights and, and communitarian rights. If you disturb that the balance, this will affect us badly. The answer to it, you know, those who are critiquing about halala, can a marriage or triple talaq, you know, WhatsApp talaq, can you? Uh, my young boys and girls are dating on WhatsApp. 
I call them, you know, one day I told one student uh, very close to me, never date on or never do romance on WhatsApp. Well, like you said, when I got morning, you were just fighting like anything. Go and meet her in the canteen, you know, give her a talk. I'm like, if the three, if the talaq's happening, the answer, feminist answer to that. I think feminists are well positioned to tackle this tensile relationship, you know, Martha Munusmam kind of. That within that, you know, community, within that community, there are two modes of modes of uh, uh, inquiry. A, within community democratization and without community dem dem democratization. So what would happen once you extend liberal set of rights to community, where every girl sitting here is enjoying and you know uh, enjoying and realizing liberal set of rights, job done. You don't have to make a law for uniform civil court. B, if the community within, there is a democratic contestation within community, that's happening. All over the world happening. In Iran, Iraq, everywhere. And it's such and look at India. India is not a Afghanistan or Taliban. So let's not think about it. And I, I would not, another hundred years, I would not worry about having a law. Just making a law is not sufficient, you know. Perhaps you will disturb that constitutional balance. Okay. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, your name and what do you teach? Hmm. West Bengal is still there is a East Bengal and West Bengal. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know there are two Bengals. Uh, was this lecture useful or uh, just I say Kalipili? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Why did you open about reserving? Do you think that it should change like this one family for one family that should be one reserving? You are speaking like a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, Ulu. Huh. 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 Got it, got it. Huh. Yeah, you could argue this case before the Supreme Court, you know, file a petition. I'm sure that it will get listed. You know. Uh, from the lighter note, uh, lighter note case on, on the issue of constitutionality and also the normative. You know. Today I'm talking about pedagogical promise. I think, you know, let's, let's think about it. Uh, I, I don't want to provoke you, but uh, uh, something that I have been saying for the last 30 years, if India has avoided the path of bloodshed or tyrannical bloodshed like Soviet Union, or the Chinese bloodshed is only because of, or we did not go the path of Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, the military dictatorship, only because of one thing. Only because of India. If India relatively remained, you know, bloodbath free after the partisan genocide last 75 years, relatively, because I would not say that we are really very good and innocent civilization. We have killed each other in massive riots. There is something, if there is something that has kept us going and made us, you know, more inclusive democratic society, one thing, reservation, equity. If the reservation hadn't happened in India since beginning, India would have torn into several places. Let me tell you, as a political scientist, less as a constitutional expert. There's no denying about it that what I call unintended effect of you know, and you look at, despite differences, the differences uh, in the Constitutional, Constitutional Assembly, all of us agreed that it has to be there. But for whom, how, you know, what, call, what we call modus operandi, we differed. And then started writing Article 15, and then the OBC Mandal, and et cetera, et cetera, of late Google and read, I'm talking about caste census, why caste census is necessary and perhaps inevitable in a society like us, even after 75 years. Just do a magic uh, of caste census and we will be fine. 
they need to know each other like you know like france or germany or italy or elsewhere so my sense is one the larger theoretical sense that india has done amazingly or perhaps unlikely success of reservation we use a word reservation which unsettles some which unsettles you know especially in the middle class middle class you know unsettling perhaps you know those who are upper caste and middle class and urban unsettling indeed if you use affirmative accent it gives affirmative means that affirmative accent means in america no constitutional mandate to fulfill the target so where your anxieties are coming actually from the quantitative part of the equity not from the normative and qualitative part so when you look at as a theorist and uh, as a jurist no jurist in india would agree with the idea that reservation is bad they will call it you know women call will call it empowerment would you would you mind your reservation in the panchayat or if you get a seat in parliament 33% would you mind that reservation you will be the first girl saying ha ah, sir milna chahiye if i give you 50% you know lecturership in the university would you say that sir i don't want it? i keep asking all my students you love the reservation well sir in what sense if i give you 50% off we are organizing a retreat and i told them i will give you 50% you know financial aid plus sir i would love that so everybody and my sense is like you know paraphrasing uh, you know everybody loves the reservation including me in some way some comes with father reservation some from the caste reservation some with class reservation if reservation is a privilege i think it has to be democratically exchanged and negotiated that's the only thing that happens so on the quantitative part that what you are referring to there are a set of economists and public policy experts who start talking about intergenerational sunset law like you got reservation you got reservation your dad got reservation there is already a creamy layer which is a judicial doctrine which is not a constitutional mandate there is already reservation available for even economically you know backward upper caste you know the, the now the case is listed for a constitutional verdict already reservation everyone is just look at from the ambedkarite position to upper caste getting reservation so the, these anxieties are actually restricted to public policy domain of quantitative part so i get reservation but my daughter should not get reservation these are what i call micro micro rational choices you know i think they may be you know uh, reason maybe i call it a uh, maybe somewhere i suggested intergenerational uh, clause that may be two two generation three generation a but there is a worry here for me pedagogical and normative will you ensure uh, you know what ambedkar referred to reverence reverence for each other as a core citizen even after three generation would you do that would you give me that promise the answer is not i'm not sure so as long as there is no predictability of that i would continue with the existing arrangement that my just if i were a judge i would write the judgment like this let me tell you, that would be my language even 3 4 5 generation you know was seven eight generation you know what ambedkar said an annihilation of caste can you do it if you do it then come back to me with your quantitative anxieties i will pass judgment let it be there i think if india has to become inclusive and far more democratic i think and this is this is the best instrument we have yes ma'am Do you believe that uh, equity over number is that equity? Don't you think that uh, this threatens equity? Not at all. That's a very mis misunderstanding of the equity and equality. What you are trying to confuse, you are combining equality. You are confusing equality with equity. Equality means equal treatment, and that is why Indian Constitution did not settle for equality, equal treatment. <laughs> you read this sir man ppt lagao i i can explain now another class <laughs> so come just just a minute sir second give chance to them they have never spoken for century <laughs> men have always even one man in a room can dominate hundreds 
man is always powerful so i sense you know that's where i tell you equity has equity has empirical component and equity has normative component so if you start and let me as a dean you know i i i look at equity and i have multi campus you know so uh, of late uh, i was designing a program and that i think will solve your conundrum uh, so there are 40 seats there and now we have to implement not just vertical equity vertical equity you know what is concerned about vertical equity we also have to do horizontal regeneration <coughs> horizontal you know like the women now we look at iit uh, 22% girls now done from 4 5% because horizontal horizontal equity so when you look at horizontal equity is that the dean is my job to ensure that there are girls also you know so i can give three marks four marks benefit to them just so, so that they can qualify and join the class also you know look at you know um, we don't have lgbt equity here um, elsewhere in the world is happening you know believe me i mean like in norway canada i was in uh, places where they are there in the classroom you know. that's going to happen that will make you a little unsettled you know but be prepared for that oh ho uh, somebody i said you know that you know i had a lesbian friend the very word lesbian shocked her i'm telling about women i'm not talking about you now i'm a gay if i tell you that i'm a gay it's still uncomfortable but that's part of the equity and that's not under the vertical equity but horizontal i have to ensure them hello so my sense is that you know equity is a much larger idea than equality most indians are tuned to the ideas of equality that we enjoy the moment you confront them with equity they become un uncomfortable uncomfortable because of also there is a you know uh, somehow if you look at uh, our housing patterns you know even in urban areas even in highly urbanized cities we still live in our own ghettos caste and class ghettos despite all this advancement and vertical reservation etc etc look at 93 secretary in the government of india hardly anyone 15 16 so there is a when you refer to equity there is a demographic anxiety you know the anxiety that sense of but theoretically equity um, uh, unassailable idea unchallenged idea worldwide you just can't go back uh, and different equality equality is just the beginning you know that are you treat me equal i treat you equal but i have to give you 30% reservation women in the parliament so i have to give you will take it i'm sure you would not come back and say that sir i am complaining about it you will enjoy it i'm sure compared to your husband losing the seat i have i have friends you know i have friends in the city parliamentarians friends i have worked you know in my bio read i have parliamentarian friends i studied together and when his constituency got turned into reserve constituency he was in tears you know what would i do i said that now go and give this speech about social justice so i'm thinking that my wife should contest i said well that's good anyway sorry any want to say good then yeah yes ma'am Hmm. Yeah, you must do that. Huh? I didn't get the last one. What was it? That's a that's a that's a good question. Yeah. Hmm. But I give you constitutional and lawyer-like answer, you know, not like theorist answer. I think just you, when I said it, you know, go back to the list of fundamental rights, a right to you know this assembly, you know, the free assembly, that is enough. That's the site. That's the site with Gandhi, Anna Hazare, Arvind Kejriwal. Everyone has used that, you know, language very well. I have been part of several sit-in movement, protest movements. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, you know uh, right from the colonial days uh, the britishers would use uh, you know what is this section 144 but now it's still uh, you know police use is 144 but there is a constitutional space available for you to do extra constitutional 
And this is where I tell you. So the constitutional and extra constitutional are dialectical. If you understand the dialectical relationship. And the source of that dialectical relationship comes from the constitution itself. And if you just read jurist papers, you know, that you have a right to, you know, form association, you can form any association. Nas Foundation went and challenged 377. That's extra constitution. When we went to the constitution bench and asked about, you know, somebody affected, I remember judges told me, why are you here? Your rights are not affected. I said that not, but their rights are affected. Who are you? I said, I speak for them. Whose petition is this? We have already settled all that through extra constitutional ways, but this extra constitutionality is not anti, I never used the term anti constitutionality. Did I? Never. I'm only suggesting extra constitution. An extra, like you take a, you know, vanilla ice cream, add a little extra, it becomes more tasty. So the constitution is a still document. If, if you just put it here, without that effort, you know, the vigilance effort, the aspirational, the pedagogical effort, the constitution will become like a still rice and dan after some days in your kitchen and fridge. To enliven it like a feminist could, you know, in the kitchen. I think great ideas come when I'm in the kitchen, you know. Some days I would teach from kitchen. Because when you are kitchen, you start experimenting with different kinds of masala, seasoning, etc. You need to season uh, constitution every decade, every time. If you don't season, season every clause, every thing, you, this constitution is stale, not usable. Raj Sekhar here is madam. Raj Sekhar, I will take your question. For the sake of equity. No, no, Raj Sekhar, for the sake of equity, Raj Sekhar. One each, no? Yes, ma'am. So, my name is Asha. I'm a scholar. So, my question is, what is feminism? What is feminism? There is no answer, I guess, you know. No, how do you think that it is misunderstood? And I never misunderstood feminism. No, my, there, I can't give you a Twitter answer here or Facebook or Instagram answer. No, my perspective is clear. I've been speaking about seasoning from the kitchen. A feminist would understand it. A man would not understand it. Yeah, and here I spoke about non-discrimination, non-domination. All I'm using a feminist language. I've already answered your question. So don't, yeah, no. But if the, the, I can understand your anxiety, where it is coming from. There are different ways of liberal feminism. There are post-liberal feminism. There are, you know... Uh, no, intersectional, intersectional is an is a, is a, is a, intersectional is a Nala Kabir, you know, our colleague, you know, does a lot of intersectional caste, class, gender, etc., etc. No, I'm not using feminism in the sense, um, but liberal feminism, you know, post-liberal feminism, uh, Hindu feminism, you know, Shiv Shena feminism, all kinds of feminism you have. Bulldozer feminism, the women who really love Yogi Ji, I was actually, and I will close here, I was doing a survey in a village. And I was question election survey. I asked question to a woman. I said, Modi ji, Prime Minister ji, yes sir, very good. I said yes, not good. Sir, Ujula gas. I'm like, oh, that's good. Giving your feminist answer. And then she surprised me, sir, sir, and very that's it, very gabaru. So then I I understood what she meant means that she is very smart and very masculine. You know, like 76, you know, like Salman Khan biceps, you know. I have met Salman Khan. I have my old friends. So, uh, but, but this fact is that, you know, feminism, uh, I would not say, although it comes in various sizes, colors, etc., etc. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, there, there is a Indic feminism, there is European feminism, there is the Middle Eastern feminism. But one thing where I guess all of us agree is feminism is about a language of empowerment. 
Feminism is a language of non-discrimination and non-domination. There's only three things about feminism. If you can find these things together, you are done. Where the differences arise, differences arise on account of modus operandi, you know, approaching a particular area, approaching a particular subject. And that is where intersubjectivity of Habermas is important. I beg to differ with you, to differ with you on uniform civil code, but still we continue to have a dialogue on this issue. That's feminism. Rasekar, say last word. Please sit down and say because you look very unsettled. Something is inside you, bottled up. Yeah. Okay. Huh. So, so where is the where is the disagreement on this? See, but but you know, let's be careful about it. I think Ambedkar's famous statement about grammar of anarchy is also about that. And in fact, he targeted Gandhi and said that, you know, if Gandhi continues to be on civil disobedience movement, the constitution will collapse. See, Baba Sahib Ambedkar was much ahead of his own time. And he was planting this constitution in a soil which was not suitable for constitution. So now you look at in the country last eight years or 10 years, what has happened? You know? If you just read Veer Savarkar, so-called Veer Savarkar, if I live in Mumbai, the Savarkar paper, if you look at his Hinduism bunch of you know, essays, if they start giving direction to the, what will happen to the country? So that is where Ambedkar gave a caution. No place for grammar of anarchy. Let this constitution be implanted. Let this tree grow. And then think about, you know, but there is no place for grammar of anarchy, not at all. But movements are fine. Civil disobedience are fine. As long as they speak the language of constitutional values. And what he famously said, and I explained in detail, the constitutional morality, reverence for the constitution, and those values that I spent time with. If you can't rever those values, you have no right to go for anarchy. See, constitution is a complex, delicate experience. You, know? you invoke constitution, even if you go to Maoist area, they have captured, even, even they fight our soldiers, our people, so-called, I mean, a government official, they also invoke constitution. Because there is a larger language of justice. But will you accept that? Will you accept that killing? So I'll leave it here. Yes, I'm done. Any other questions, I guess, ma'am? Or I take your leave and... Uh, that's it. And I'm not taking it home. No, sir, I need it to use. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for patiently answering all the questions. Uh, we, we were actually delighted to hear you.